Good morning. Thank you for joining this morning for worship. I hope that you are doing well. As we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord this morning, I want us to focus on the infiniteness of God. Infinite means that there is no end, that there is no way to measure or contain, that it is boundless. Um, and that is who God is. He is infinite. And so that means that everything that He is is also infinite. He is infinite in love, in mercy, in compassion, in justice, in power. This is the God whom we come to. This is the God whom we call Father. And this is the God who we are going to worship this morning. And so as we join together from your home and from my home and from wherever you are, let us raise the name of Jesus and worship Him because He is worthy.
Lord, how we delight to sing your praises. For you are the God who is infinite in mercy, in love, in power, in compassion. And because of that, Lord, we know that we can come to you and we can bring to you all of our burdens, everything, Father, that weighs down upon our hearts. Because we know that you are the God who is able to do immeasurably more than what we ask. Father, you are the God who is able. You are the God who is faithful, the God who never fails. And we love you. so grateful Lord for all that you have done for us for securing our eternal salvation through your son Jesus Christ oh Lord you are so worthy and you are so good from the beginning of time you have been calling us oh Lord into a relationship with you 
That is our purpose, O oh God. You've called us to live in fellowship with you. And yet, Lord, the greatest tragedy in human history is when man has rejected to be in a relationship with you. O oh God, have mercy on us. May you, O oh Lord, be our greatest delight, for there is truly nothing else in this world that satisfies like you. Draw us, O oh Lord. Draw us closer to you. Sea bellows 
your mercies. We thank you, O Lord, for you have regarded our helpless estate and you have nailed on the cross all, O God, not in part, but all, all of our sins. And so, God, when we stand before you, we can have peace because we know, Lord, that we are righteous before you on account of your son, Jesus Christ. And so now, God, we bring to you our offerings. It is a small portion, O oh Lord, from the abundance that you have given us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, and we give these to you with a cheerful heart. And we ask, O oh Lord, that these offerings would be used, Lord, to make your, your, your work of salvation known Lord, this world needs your peace and it needs your forgiveness. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would make yourself known. Use us, Lord, as your church and receive these offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father.
Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you again. And this is my first opportunity to preach after the election. And I'm very burdened to preach this message because uh, this election is extraordinary and not in the best sense. And this election is like everything that has happened this year, 2020, everything is extraordinary. And so let me pray before we start. And Father, we give you thanks for you are good. And we lift our eyes to you and place our trust in you. And we ask that you will come and show us the truth in your words. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, half of the country has been celebrating that Joe Biden is the president-elect. And they are celebrating also for the first female vice president-elect, Harris. Feelings of optimism and hope fuel their hearts and a feeling of relief because President Trump would not be the president comes to January 20th. And they look forward to uh, the dismantling of the policies that President Trump has set in place. And they also feel like finally a nice person is being elected to replace a ter per terrible person who is a racist, sexist, who is homophobic, misogynistic, and a big liar. And this group of people are just as happy as they can be for now. And some even cried as the news media projected that Joe Biden have won the presidency. And yet, at the same time, half of the country is in disbelief. They cannot believe that President Trump did not win and how half of the country can vote for a 70-year-old person to lead this country, and how the country has chosen the most liberal senator ever to be the vice president. And many of these people who are in disbelief, they believe that the election has been stolen from them. And they believe that the Democrats cheated and stole the election. And this group of people believes that the election results are not yet finalized since the votes have not been certified yet. And many of them still hold on to the hope that after all the investigations of the fraud and the irregularities of the voting, that this race will be turned and President Trump will continue to serve as a president. And yet, some of the people from this group have already given up. And they suffer grief and sadness, at the same time angry. And these people are sad. And so, in this extraordinary time, and in this extraordinary election, how are Christians supposed to make sense of it all? And how are Christians supposed to look at this election? Well, we must see exactly what God sees. So today, we are going to look into Psalm 33 and ask ourselves two questions. The first question is, what does God see in this election? And the second question is this, what does God require of us, the believers, after the election? And so we will first read from verses 13 to 17 to see what God sees. So Psalm 33, 13 to 17, 
Let me read for us. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. From where he sits enthroned, he looks down on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might, it cannot rescue. So from here, verse 13 to 15, it tells us that God made us all and that He sees everything. All the deeds and the action of every human being, we cannot hide anything from Him. Nothing is hidden from him. Sometimes when I have to leave home and I have to leave my kids at home, they're old enough to stay home now. And I'll remind them, even though I may not be here, God is always watching. And that is the truth. And here in also in uh, verse 15, it says that God also fashioned all of the hearts of men, which is telling us that God also sees the motives of our hearts. God not only knows our deeds, whether it's hidden or not, God also knows our deepest thoughts, motivations of our heart, what drives us, what moves us to do things, and what we are drawn to. God knows it all. And here, the next couple of verses is a conclusion of what God sees. And this is exactly what God sees. And uh, the scripture is warning us not to fall into the same trap. So God sees that kings think that if they have strong military, they will be safe and stay in power. And guess who has the most powerful military in the world? God also sees that people think that if they are strong, they can deliver themselves from losing the battles. And lastly, God also sees that people think that if they have horses, they will for sure win every war. And that's from verse 16 and 17. It says this, The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his strength, great strength. And the war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. And so we have to understand this. When horse, horses were first introduced in the battle, it gave the army such a great advantage that their opponents could not overcome. And it was a huge deal for the armies to have horses. So the horses were first introduced to the battle around 1500 BC. But back then, the horses were uh, used mostly to pull the chariot. And so one person in the back of the chariot and, and the horses pull them into the battlefield and they fight like that. And it gives them a lot of advantage. But then in, the 1900, in 900 BC, uh, a group of people figured out that if they, each of them were to ride on a horseback and go into the battle, it would give them even more advantage to defeat the, their opponents. And guess who this group of people are? They are Asians. And so they feel like if they, so people feel like if they have horses, the battle is already won. So he, here God sees that people are placing their hopes in the strength of their army, the strength of their warriors, and the horses. And this type of thinking is actually very prevalent and is still happening today. If you have more powerful a group of people who are skilled, then you will win every time. And this type of thinking is very evident for those who are uh, playing fantasy sports. 
especially football. They think that if they have good players on, on their team, they will win. And that's why people spend so much time arranging their lineup every week. And so what does God see in this election? What God sees is this. God sees that people think that if they can raise more money than their, uh, for their political party than their opponents, then they can engage in more ads to destroy their opponents. And they also can hire more people to mobilize voters to vote for their presidential candidate. And they, uh, they hope that by placing, by electing the presidential candidate that they're hoping for, that their world, their lives will become better. So God sees people placing hope in the political parties and also in the presidential candidate. And God also sees that the political parties are relying on their own human wisdom and strategies to win the election and eventually to lead this country. So the bottom line of what God sees is that people are trying to look to everything else other than God to deliver them. And that is why uh, after every election, uh, those who voted for the, one, the, 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 the candidate that won are always so excited. And those who have lost feels miserable. And so whether you are on the Republican side or the Democrat side, God is reminding us, we do not look to human institution for salvation. So the next question to ask is this, now that the election took place, what does God require of us, Christians? And here's the big news. What God requires of the Christians after the election are the exact same things that He required of us before the election and during the election. In another word, our duties as citizens of the kingdom of God has not changed one bit because of the result of the election. Our purpose remains the same. Our goals remain the same. Nothing can alter the commands that God has already given to the church. And if anything, we should be even more resolved in accomplishing the purposes that God has already given us. Because the only hope for this lost world is God. And we are continuing, we, are, we, we must continue to share the gospel, continue to stand up for righteousness, continue to care for the poor, continue to uh, give, continue to not give up meeting together through Zoom for now, and continue to serve one another and continue to pray so that we can establish God's kingdom on earth. And so now, let's look at the next few verses. From 18 to 22, it said this, Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope is in His steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. So simply stated, God is telling us God is asking us at this time to trust in Him alone, 
not the political leaders, not the processes, but to remain strong in Him and in His steadfast love. Steadfast means unchanging. Unlike the political climate, it changes. Who's in control of the country will change. But God's steadfast love will never change. And so that's what God is requiring of us, to look to Him and nothing else for our salvation. Because in these verses, it said that those who look to Him, those who fear Him, can have a heart filled with joy. And even in the midst of disappointment, even in the midst of tragedy or sorrow, so, what are some evidence of a person who fully trusts in God's unfailing love now that the election has taken place? So here are some of the evidence of a person who trusts in God's steadfast love. And so we'll have to look to the rest of the Psalm 33. And the first part we're going to look to is verse 1 to 3. Psalm 33, 1 to 3, it says this, Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shout. So, one of the evidence of a person who truly looks to God and hoping God and who fears God is this. They are true worshipers. They look to God. They are amazed uh, by who God is and what He has done. And they make music to Him. They sing from the depth of their soul to Him. And their worship is not hindered by the result of the politics. These are the people who lift up their eyes to the mountain because they know that's where their true help comes from. It comes from God. And once they lift up their eyes to the Lord, they are amazed by His beauty and they worship Him. They shout for joy because they're amazed by God. And they understand that God is worthy to be praised. So, from these three verses, we see some evidences of a person who trusts in the steadfast love of the Lord. One, they're true worshipers. Second is this, is that they see God's deeds and they give Him praise. You know, in the midst, uh, even after election, God is at work. He is always at work. If you would stand still and look around what God is doing, you would see His deeds. And when you see His deeds, you cannot help but praise Him. There are plenty of things. Like last night, oh, today is Thursday, I'm recording the message. So last night, it was Wednesday, we had uh, our prayer meeting. And in our Zoom prayer meeting, we all ended up praising God. Our hearts were filled with joy because one brother who has experienced God's love through the church, he has decided to follow Jesus. He has prayed to turn away from his sins and to receive the forgiveness that's from God and to become a devoted follower of Christ. So look around. God is at work. God's work is everywhere. We just need to, to look for it. And when we see it, we give Him praise. And the third thing, uh, another evidence of the, the, 
a person who trusts in steadfast love of the Lord is this. In verse 2, it said, give thanks to the Lord. So a person who can be thankful in all circumstances, whether if this person voted for Trump or Biden, his joy does not reside on who won or who lost, but on who God is and what he has done. This person can give thanks in all circumstances. And we will talk about give thanks in all circumstances next Sunday. So another evidence of a person who trusts in the steadfast love of the Lord is this. This person, if you look at verse 3, this person has a new song to sing often. Not singing old songs, but new ones. So how does new songs come about? New songs come when one person encounter God's goodness and His grace like He has never before. And so when you encounter God's goodness and grace, a new insight of who God is, and from there, you have new songs to sing because you are drawn deeper into God's love, God's grace, and His presence. And because of that, this person has new songs to sing. Now let's continue to look from verse 4 to 7. It said this, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts he gathers the waters of the seas as a heap. He puts to the deeps in storehouses. So here is telling us two things. First is this, to take God's word seriously. God's word has power. God's spoken word has power. The Bible tells us that once God speaks, it never returns empty. We must take his word seriously. So that's another evidence of a person who trusts in the steadfast love of the Lord, is that he takes God's word seriously. Learn to read it, learn to memorize it, meditate on it, because through that, we would encounter God afresh and we have new songs to sing. And on the, my personal, based on my personal experience, now when I read the Bible, just reading, not memorizing, or much meditation, I can literally feel my spiritual legs become weak. And I'm less sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and more inclined to seek my selfish ways. And so, meditation and memorization of the Scripture is critical if we were to take God's Word seriously. Now, let's look at the next one. From verse 8 to 12, it said this, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in all of Him. For He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsels of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plan of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. So here in verse 8, it's telling us, we need to fear the Lord. So this is another evidence of a person who fully trusts in the steadfast of the Lord than anything else, than the politics, the political leaders, everything. If this person who trusts in the Lord, this person, the evidence, uh, one of the evidence is that this person fears God. To fear God is to give Him the ultimate reverence. To fear God is to live to please Him. To fear God is to take Him seriously. If He says He's like that, we take Him 
seriously. Take his holiness seriously. Take his righteousness seriously. And take sin seriously. And so the rest of the, the verse from uh, verse 9 to, 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 to 12, it tells us that God brings counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates them easily. And then he said this in verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If we look at our country right now, after the election, we see how far our country has turned from God. This country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Even though a lot of the founding fathers were not Christians, but they take God's principles seriously. But look how far we have come. Look around our society. Look around our TV programs. We have strayed far from God. If we want this country to be blessed, it said that if you want to be blessed, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. The only way that America is going to be blessed is if we all turn to God again through repentance. That's the only way. So here is a new slogan that I have shared with a lot of people already. MAGA, M-A-G-A, -A. make America godly again. Because that is the only hope for this nation. If we would all look to God, repent of our ways, and trust in His steadfast love, that's the only way. So, what are some practical things that you can begin to do as a result of this passage? One, regardless what camp you are, Republican or Democrat, lift up your eyes to the mountains because that's where our help comes from. Lift up your eyes and become the worshiper that God is looking for. Look to God and be amazed by Him and praise Him because of who He is, what He has done, and learn to give Him thanks. So that's application one. Lift up your eyes and worship Him. Second thing we can do is to take God's Word seriously. Read it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Let the Word of God so dwell richly in our hearts that it will take root and bear fruit for God's kingdom. And the third thing is this, learn to fear God more than anything. In everything that we do, we should ask, God, does this please you? Does this please you? And we learn to fear Him. Take Him seriously. And lastly, what we must do is that we must always be ready to share the good news of the gospel. Again, what this country needs is not Joe Biden. It's not Donald Trump. It's God. Only if we turn to God and submit to Him can America be blessed. So be ready, live out your faith, 
and be ready to share. Trust in the Lord alone. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks because you are trustworthy. And over history, you have proven yourself to be a faithful God. And you bless those who trust in you and not what this world has to offer. So, Lord, help us to keep keep our eyes upon you and see what you see and turn away from things that will take our focus off of you. Renew us, lead us to repentance so that we can experience more of you so that our worship to you will become richer and more meaningful. Lord, help us. Bless our homes, bless our neighborhoods, our cities, by turning people to you. And lastly, bless this country by turning all hearts to you. We trust in you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now, I would like to say a special prayer for a couple of people. One, you already know that Freddie uh, has colon cancer and uh, will start receiving treatment. And this morning, I just heard that our beloved teacher, Brenda, is diagnosed with breast cancer. And she will have tests done so they will know the proper treatment for her. So right now, let us pray for Freddie, his family, and Teacher Brenda. Let's pray. Father, we come before you because you are a good God and that we can trust in you. And Father, we want to lift up our brother Freddie and our beloved sister, Teacher Brenda. Lord, as they go through this difficult time, May you be the lifter of their heads so that they can look to you, so that they can trust in your steadfast love, so that even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they will not fear anything, but instead they will be able to worship you because you have prepared a table for them in the presence of their enemies. So Lord, we pray that both of them will be healed. And as they go through all the processes, may they experience your peace and joy. We also lift up their family members that they too will learn to trust in you and experience the peace that comes from your presence. And we pray in the name of Jesus, Amen.
mai